Hello, everybody. Hi, Second Shift members. This is March Menopause Madness, and we are having our Second Shift Wellness webinar today. The focus is going to be all about your sexual health. And we're joined by Dr. Sarah Daryl Latore, who has been an OBGYN for 20 years. And she is also a, um, has a lot of training in menopause and lifestyle medicine. This is gonna be very open and free flow as a conversation today. So there's no big presentation like we usually have. This is just chatting. Everybody has a lot of questions. There's a lot of things we need to know. We have a very special guest, which is Gina Hadley, because Gina has a lot of questions that she wants to ask. So she is joining the conversation. And um, any questions that you have and you want answered, just throw it in the Q&A. We'll make sure to get to everybody's question. Um, we've got an hour with Dr. Sarah. I want to give a special shout out to Joy Lux, who is the sponsor of this um, this webinar and they have this really cool female founded company that has innovative red light devices and intimate care products. And it's all backed by science and it's really focused on menopausal women. So thank you to Joy Lux. And just one more thing, I'm wearing pink because it is International Women's Month, March. And um, this is a perfect topic to kick that off because this is something that is coming for all women. It doesn't matter if you have kids, it doesn't matter what age you are, at some point, this topic is relevant to you. So let's start, Dr. Sarah, thank you so much for joining us. This is um, very exciting for everybody. So you you tell us what we, everything we need to know, please. You got it, I'll just lay it all out for you guys. So it's nice to meet everyone. I'm really excited to be here. Um, I just had sat with girlfriends the other night and I was telling them that I was gonna do this and they all said, thank God, because we don't know anything about this. Why don't we know? It's like when you have a baby and all of a sudden the world, the curtain gets pulled back on all the things that happen after you have a baby that you had no idea about. So I like to prepare women, um, just talk about menopause. We don't talk about it enough. It's sort of a taboo subject because it means old and I wanna sort of dispel that myth. Um, there's a lot that goes on in our reproductive lives and menopause is just one of those transitions. So I'd like to start talking a little bit about the definition of menopause because I think it is somewhat confusing for women. What does it mean? How does it happen? I think a lot of women think it just happens and then it's over. Um, but there's a sort of what of a long transition to going to menopause. The definition of menopause truly being menopausal is when you have not had a period for a full year. So when you can say last period was over a year ago, you should be officially menopausal. And then that means you're somewhat postmenopausal because you've gone through this transition to menopause. Perimenopause though is this time frame in our lives that can last a year, it can last 10 years. It's just the transition as we're sort of not our egg quality, you know, our ovaries are producing eggs every month, though the quality and the quantity are starting to wane. So we're less likely to get pregnant, we're more likely to have symptoms, and we're just on our way on this journey to having our last period and no more eggs left, which is essentially what menopause is. Um, does that make sense, <laughs> Jenny and Gina, so far? Yeah, that makes sense. I get it. So you can have, you have all the symptoms in the perimenopause, then you have menopause, then for that whatever year, and then you're on the other side of it, you're postmenopausal. Right, and some women will have symptoms in postmenopause. I mean, my mother had hot flashes for years, and so you'll see women in their 60s, you know, still doing this, which is, you know, a bummer, um, but it does happen. But the intense symptoms, hot flashes, anxiety, mood swings, vaginal dryness, start more in the late 40s where you can feel that transition. And a lot of this has to do with hormones. So every month, again, our ovaries produce eggs, those eggs produce estrogen, then we get a progesterone boost after we ovulate. But in our 40s and in the perimenopausal transition, we oftentimes are not ovulating every month. So we're getting this rise in estrogen, but we don't get that progesterone little boost and then that can lead to anxiety. So some women notice, gosh, my PMS is so much worse. I'm really anxious, I'm not sleeping well, I'm hot flashing, night sweats, 
or just mood. I'm just really anxious before my period. So all of these things can be traced to hormones and to perimenopause. Um, just to touch on mood disorders a little bit more, you know, thankfully our, you know, our mental health has become a focus, especially in the last year, you know, with COVID, but I really try to correlate our mental health with our hormones. And I think, um, women miss that sometimes in their own life, you know, they can see, oh, I get PMS but they, if they're not really tracking it, they may not see that um, a lot of anxiety can come up at certain times during the month and it can be really hormonally related. And then that's a time to maybe consider hormone replacement therapy, even if you haven't technically gone through menopause. Okay, um, is that that's a very helpful. I don't even know where to start the questions. Gina, you have a question you wanna kick it off with? Cause I have a list. Um, I just wanted to, um thank Dr. Sarah for being here with us today. I know I am, um, I think deep in that first year with no period. Um, it has been the, a, a, a self-discovery that I had hoped that this journey I would never really be on because it wasn't something my mother ever talked about. It wasn't something that any of us have been educated on. But one of the things that I find, um, that I found really disconcerting about all of it was the mood swings. And it's not something that I was ready for. I wasn't ready for everyone to be so annoying all the time. <laughs> and but is that COVID or your mood? I don't know. I think maybe Wait. this is the perfect storm, but I do know that I have some of my friends that um, we've now talked about it. And it is this feeling of, completely unbased, unbased rage sometimes, just so angry and annoyed and I can't figure out why. And now I'm beginning to realize that it is completely like hormonally developmentally appropriate. Yeah, and the, the issue with it is, so your estrogen levels are kind of up and down in perimenopause. And then as you stop having eggs produced, then that's pretty status quo. And estrogen is our, Estrogen's our feel-good hormone. Like it makes us sassy. It's that part of us that kind of lights us up. And then progesterone, which sometimes gets a bad rap, that's more of our calming. Progesterone is, um, when you take progesterone and hormone replacement therapy, if you take micronized progesterone, you sleep so great. Like it's, it's sedating in a way and it's calming. So we're not getting, when we don't get that progesterone boost, we're irritable. <laughs> were and it is as you described Gina it's like underneath your skin you just feel like you're gonna pop out of your skin sometimes I've had women say they just feel like they're gonna snap um so that's a terrible way to live and so I think if we're able to recognize like why am I so irritable oh gosh it may be my hormones it's not because my husband's driving me crazy and I want to get divorced or you know these things it's this is hard to go through and so then talking to your provider what can I do, whether I want to take hormones or not? What are some things that I can do to help manage it? And um, I was wondering, so sorry, to, to that point, can you kind of, because a lot of us grew up with the mythology around taking estrogen is going to give you breast cancer. Yeah. So I was wondering yeah. if you might be able to speak a little bit to where that came from and whether or not that holds true anymore. Sure, absolutely. So I was a resident when it was early 2000s, 2003, I think 2002, when the Women's Health Initiative came out. And it was a really large study that looked at um, hormone replacement therapy, risk of breast cancer, colon cancer, um, and then the benefits. There's a couple, there was several flaws with that study. Um, one of them is lumping all estrogens and progesterones into the estrogen and progesterone that was studied in that landmark study. So it, so estrogen and progesterone got a bad rap, I mean, immediately. Women went off their hormones immediately and there were, I think, terrible repercussions from it um, in terms of mental health, not sleeping well, hot flashes, but everyone was so, so, so scared. And then a time frame since then, there have been follow-up, you know, looking at the data, other studies that have shown that estrogen alone is not related to breast cancer. The safest way to use any hormones is topically, if you can, um, 
then there's a lot of um, talk about bioidentical hormones. And bioidentical hormones are, are different than the hormones that were studied in the Women's Health Initiative. Um, as a side note, just so everybody knows where I'm coming from, I am a board certified OBGYN. I'm a fellow of ACOG, um, very much traditionally trained. And then I've done additional training in functional medicine, which is more of an integrative approach um, to our health. And then I have the lifestyle medicine training and menopausal training. So I've looked at all, all aspects of this. Um, and where I fall on it and how I counsel my patients is I, I don't like to prescribe um, non-bioidentical hormones. But I'm also not on the um, side of, I'm careful with which bioidentical hormones I prescribe. So I love to prescribe FDA approved estradiol patches because I know what is in them. It's topical. It's not going to increase a woman's risk of having a blood clot, which oral medications do. If anyone is still on an oral estrogen in the year 2021, I think you need a second opinion. Um, your estrogen should be topical. Progesterone, again, different from the landmark study, progesterone, the bioidentical one, is called micronized progesterone. It can be used vaginally, it can be used as a um, pill. Um, I tend to curate it for my patients and do compounding of, because I think when women are in their 40s, 100 milligrams, which is what menopausal women take, can be a little much and can cause some mood issues, so sometimes 50 milligrams. Um, but the thing with bioidenticals, I think there's a huge range of them that you can prescribe, but I like to stick with what's FDA approved because I know what's in the, and then I use a really um, well um, reputed um, uh, compounding pharmacy. But back to your original question, that is where estrogen and progesterone got a bad rap. There have been follow-up studies because progesterone is really the culprit in the breast cancer from this study. This progesterone is something called Provera or um, Medroxyprogesterone. And that, it, in my mind, is not a safe progesterone. I don't put any of my patients on it long-term. You know, sometimes we need to induce a period or something, we can use it. But otherwise, a bioidentical um, progesterone. And those, that progesterone, Micronize, has not been linked to breast cancer um, in the majority of studies. So I do feel like it is safe for women to take uh, one more thing, the party line, I would say, about hormones is that women, if they don't have any other risk factor, and you know, they've never had a breast cancer themselves, they don't have a uterine cancer, or they don't have a history of blood clots, there's sort of a list of what we would say you should not use hormones. If you don't fall into that quality, uh, sorry, in that category, I would say most OBGYNs would have, would prefer women to be on hormones if they're having symptoms and to be on them for two to five years. And their quality of life will be so much better if they are, in my opinion. And also their brains for later on in terms of um, your brain function when you're older. Can I ask can you, you, we have No, wanted to say, what's bioidentical? Can you explain that? Or just because I don't know. Bioidentical is, it's a little bit of a marketing thing too. I have to be honest. It's a little bit of, oh, you know, are you on bioidenticals? A, a little bit of that, which... Um, bothers me because it does have bioidenticals. A lot of OBGYNs, when you come to them and say, I want bioidenticals, they kind of roll their eyes inside their head. Um, but it is, there, is, there is data about it and there is, it's different than what a pharmaceutical company will um, provide for us in terms of what's FDA approved. So a bioidentical is more, they want to say it's identical to what your body is producing. So Estradiol is the is E2. We have three different types of estrogens, E1, E2, E3. E2 is sort of the predominant one um, um, that we are usually having when we're not pregnant and, and um, when we're um, reproductive. And so that affects our vaginas, it affects our brains, our breasts, our ovaries, and it's more closely related to the estrogen that we actually produce. So that's what a bioidentical is. Same with the progesterone. The micronized progesterone, which is bioidentical, is almost exactly like the progesterone that our bodies produce instead of a formulated chemical, um, even though they're all chemicals, um, a formulated chemical that doesn't match what our body produces. We have two questions, a few questions about the hormones. One is, do patches increase, increase clotting? And what about for people who have had breast cancer in the past? Really good question. So um, topical 
creams, gels, patches should not increase your risk of a blood clot because when the, the reason, so our clotting factors come from our liver, um, this is high level. So when we take an oral pill, it, there's a liver bypass. So it goes through the liver and that's what can, that, that's where estrogen has its effect on clotting factors. So if you're not taking anything oral, if you're just putting it on your skin, it's not going through your liver and it does not increase your risk of blood clot. Interestingly, a birth control patch uh, does increase your risk of clotting um, because it's the it has slightly higher estrogen in it. But again, it's a different type of estrogen than what's used in an estradiol patch. So it can be a little confusing. I want to put that out there. And um, and for breast cancer survivors, when a woman has had a breast cancer, um, most of the time it is um, estrogen and progesterone receptor positive, meaning, and that's a good thing to have them estrogen and um, progesterone receptor positive because it means it's a less aggressive cancer most of the time. Um, but when you have a cancer that's receptive to a certain hormone, you don't want to give that hormone. So most providers would not give an estrogen or progesterone to a woman who's had breast cancer before. So what do you do at that point? You just you do, I would do phytoestrogens, so plant-based um, in your diet and then supplements. Um, so soy is a really good example. I think there's confusion over soy as well. So when soy is organic and non-genetically modified, when you get a really good soy product, it does not cause breast cancer. So people are worried, oh, I shouldn't have soy if I've had breast cancer or anything like that. So phytoestrogens, what those are, those are plant-based um, plant based products or plant plants <laughs> that have estrogen receptor binding capacity. So they can bind onto the estrogen receptor. The reason why that's good is because one, you bind onto the estrogen receptor, so then bad estrogens can't bind. And then you actually get the benefit of having that estrogen receptor. It's like it has estrogen on it. So black cohosh is, and you know, people have heard about that for hot flashes. There's some great supplements out there that like, you know, that are sort of menopause formulas and they take a lot of plants and they put them together and those are phytoestrogens. And so they bind to our receptors and help reduce our symptoms. So a woman with breast cancer history, I feel very comfortable giving her phytoestrogens, very comfortable because they work differently than an estrogen. We have so many questions about some of the symptoms of menopause from weight gain to hair loss to libido um, and what to expect. Also like heavy periods. Yeah. What are some of the things that you can do to, uh, to fight off those specific um, side effects and physical effects? Yeah. So, so all of our, all of our stuff is hormones. Right. So whether that hormone is cortisol, whether it's estrogen, testosterone, progesterone, I feel there's many things, other things in the body, but the hormone, your thyroid, your, you know, all the hormones from your pituitary, our bodies are ruled by hormones. You know, if you ever have a teenage son or daughter, you know, you just see it in action, but our, our, you know, our bodies are ruled by hormones. Um, and these hormones are all connected. So if your thyroid's messed up, your periods are gonna be messed up, right? So we're, it's all connected. And this is what I love about functional medicine in particular. It talks about the HPTA axis, which is basically your brain to your thyroid, to your ovaries, um, and that they're all connected. So when our hormones are out of whack, or I don't wanna make menopause like out of whack, when they're changing, you see, you see symptoms from it. So hair loss, hair loss is caused by many things. But estrogen and pro, you know our estrogen and progesterone, our hair loves that stuff. And so when we're young and we have lots of it, we have like, you know, luxurious hair. A lot of us did. Um, and then as we get older and those estrogens are um, going down and progesterones are going down, then we start to see those effects. When you think about women after they have a baby and then we just lose all that hair, that's because we were on this high of estrogen and then it's plummeted. And so our hair changes its growth phase. So um, hair loss. The hot flashes and night sweats are definitely related to cortisol. So if a woman is really stressed out in life, which happens in midlife when we're going through these transitions anyway, um, 
it worsens our symptoms. It worsens our night sweats. It worsens our hot flashes. It worsens our mood issues. I don't want to get too technical, but I think it's really interesting. In our adrenal glands, um, where a lot of our hormones are produced, if you're shunting, if you're so stressed out and you need cortisol, right? Because we're like on fire all the time, alarms, you know, as as moms, working women, just, you know, life in, the, in 2020 and 2021. Um, a lot of your hormones are sort of used up trying to produce cortisol. And this is a not an exactly scientific way to explain it, but we divert our estrogen and progesterone in products to more cortisol to keep us going. So then we have worsening hot flashes, night sweats, and mood swings. So I'll get back to that in terms of how to manage your symptoms. Those are, so we talked about mood swings, night sweats, hot flashes. Um, vaginal dryness is a big bummer, but that's a big part of perimenopause. Women can start to notice those changes um, and then definitely in menopause. And what that is, is not only um, the inside of the vagina, you know, the vagina is a long tube. Um, it starts to get dry. Sex can become uncomfortable, harder to get lubricated. You can more likely to have infections, but then also the external tissue, the vulva, the labia, the lips are just sort of, you know, just a little less plump. Um, they lose their elasticity and then also somewhat dry. So these are all the wonderful things that are going to happen to you. It's so terrible to talk about. Um, but in terms of how to manage these things, so I'm, as you know, a big lifestyle person and it does really matter how you're living your life. It really does matter what food you're putting in your body, how you're moving, your weight matters, but there's so much pressure on women to have our weight be a certain thing. And so it's kind of like, don't be obese instead of be super skinny. It's like, just don't be really, really, really heavy because that also really messes with your hormones, makes it harder on your body to sort of process hormones and be your healthiest. Um, so a plant-based diet, is really the best way to eat. It does not mean you have to be a vegan or a vegetarian all the time, but when most of your food, most of your nutrition is coming from plants, um, healthy fats, avocado, olive oil, you need fat in your diet, nuts for your skin. That's one of the things we didn't talk about. Your skin gets kind of less elastic and dry without estrogen. Um, but so eating a really healthy diet, hydration, you know, drinking water is really important. Reducing alcohol, um, really important. Reducing sugar. I know, I know, especially with COVID, like, um, but that goes along with the weight in the middle. You know, we women will tend to put on weight in their middle around menopause. And I've had a million women say to me, I am eating this way. I am exercising and I still just have this. What is this? Um, and what that is, is that our estrogen to testosterone ratio is changing. So our testosterone is going up in relationship to what our estrogen was. So we deposit fat like men do. We put it around our bellies instead of estrogen likes to put fat on our butt and hips. Testosterone likes to put fat around our bellies. Um, so, you know, low sugar, all this stuff we kind of know we should be doing. It's, it's really important, <clears throat> I think, from age... 40 on and um, just to be really aware of those things and on it. I also think supplements help. Um, we reviewed, reviewed a few of those. Um, I'm, see, I keep, I'm keeping on talking. Let me stop and then let any other questions kind of interject. Well, the, the, uh, the question of testosterone has definitely come up where people want, are questioning like the relationship to testosterone to libido and whether or not testosterone supplements are something that you want, but then what if it's making you gain weight? So what, what, where, where's the line in that? So when, when someone wants to do testosterone supplementation, you really need to see a provider who's had a lot of experience in it. To be honest, um, most traditionally trained, conventionally trained OBGYNs are not gonna be into giving testosterone because there is no FDA testosterone approved for women, which is unfortunate. What about the gel? I've heard of like a supplemental, like like gel that yeah, you can rub on your arm or something like. Extra. It's approved for men, um, but it's not um, approved for women. And testosterone has somewhat of a bad rap in the sense that we think it, you know, changes your lipid profile to more negative. 
women get scared because um, conventional OBGYNs, I was trained to say, well, you know, you're going to get hair growth, your clitoris might get really big, your voice may deepen. That's crazy. I mean, we just need a little bit of testosterone to supplement. So there are, um, you can use the gel for men, there's injections, you can put a pellet, there's pellets you can put in, um, insert into the um, tissue in your bottom, not like inside your bottom, but in the skin in your bottom, um, in your hip. There's um, topical, I would never take it orally. Um, but yeah, there's, seeing a provider, I think a little bit of testosterone is a good thing for women if their libido's in the tank. Um, it helps with muscle mass, it helps with brain health. So you need to see a provider that um, knows what they're doing. And then you need to, I would always suggest not getting a pellet off the bat. Pellets are, to me, they're very controversial. I'm not comfortable with um, giving them, but trying a little testosterone topically has helped a lot of um, women that I've taken care of. DHEA is another option. So DHEA is one of our hormones, again, from our adrenal glands, that is kind of a youthful hormone. I mean, it just is a feel good one. It's a precursor to testosterone. We have a lot of it when we're young. Like if we peak, I think at age 24 or something in our DHA levels and then they kind of just sort of wane. Um, so I often have patients try a DHA supplement it's just a melt under your tongue tab and I would start more like five milligrams and see how you feel and do that a couple times a week. Just sort of I, with the hormones, you don't want to go big. You want just a little drop, especially in your 40s and 50s. It's a little drop, see how you feel, little drop, see how you feel. Um, so that's testosterone is good is the answer. It just has to be and a very tiny amount and, and sort of a sweet spot for every person. And everybody's a little bit different. There are a range of companies that are out there now. I've heard of a whole bunch of companies, including Joylux, where, um, that are focused on menopausal women, which I think is a really great solution. And this is a white space for women who need help and are not getting, like we're seeing so many things that are not approved or unknown. So what are the, people are asking like specifically if there's types of supplements or brands of supplements or products that you are, that you like versus ones that are um, maybe dangerous? Yeah. So I think um, in terms of, well, first of all, when you are, if you, if you're a woman who's sort of struggling with, I don't know where to start. I think the first thing to do is to educate yourself and, 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 and journal, write down your symptoms and take a month and just follow it's, I mean, it may be a little bit of belly button gazing, but I think it's really important. Follow your cycle for four to six weeks. Okay. Today I felt great today. I felt terrible. Just kind of, and then also kind of keeping an eye on what you're eating, like getting, you need the data about your own body, what you're doing to your body, what your body's technically doing with you. And then you can find a good provider and go over it you know, research some stuff on the internet, but more importantly, go find a good provider who's open-minded, who's well-educated, and who has ideally a blend of conventional and less conventional medicine training. <clears throat> then um, that that's the first most important thing is figure out what your symptoms are and what cycle, what, are they cyclical, what's happening? In terms of products and things like that, um, supplement wise, I have certain brands that I use and I don't, I don't wanna mention them because I don't you know, feel comfortable, but I would just say that the most important thing is that they're third party tested um, and that can be an NSF um, thing stamp, but it means that they're high quality and third party tested. So you're actually getting what you think you're getting. So I would not go to your local drugstore and buy vitamins ever. I would go to Although I think Costco is now certifying theirs, um, but they need to be third-party certified. I would look at, um, generally speaking, I think women should be on a multivitamin because our nutrition is not so great. Even if you're a healthy eater, just our food sources are not what they used to be. So a multivitamin, maybe consider an omega, like a fish oil. Um, magnesium is really important for women. It's very calming, it reduces anxiety, it makes you go to the bathroom, which a lot of women suffer with constipation with hormone changes. Um, those are sort of the three big ones. Then you can get a little bit more fancy if you want, like CoQ10 is really good for our hearts. 
really good for our um, brains. And as we get older, our brains are super important and can start to feel the effects of all the things we've done in our life. Um, CoQ10, I would say is, you know, very, very important. That's also important for fertility. So younger women should consider being on it after age 35. Um, thinking of all the things that I take. <laughs> Uh, for anxiety, theanine, L-theanine is amazing. Um, it's an amino acid. You can take, it comes in 100 milligrams. You can take that, you know, 200 milligrams five times a day. It's really, it kind of takes the edge off. Um, so th those are some options in terms of, so that's sort of, you know, wellness, wellness and not relating specifically to symptoms. I want to touch on vaginal dryness a little bit because I feel like of all the symptoms women have, libido and vaginal dryness, sexual health stuff is the least talked about. Um, no one really wants to talk about the fact that their sex drive is in the toilet. I, or in their vagina. I want to talk about it. I want to talk about it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we, you want to admit it, but you want, it's not like people are like, let's go talk about, you know, but yeah. So it's, again, it's these changing hormones where all of our hormones are decreasing. Your testosterone is decreasing. It just happens to be higher in ratio, what I was talking about earlier, to your estrogen. Um, <clears throat> and then there's less blood flow to our pelvic organs or specifically our vagina as we get older, as the estrogen keeps our vaginas nice and plump and elastic and lots of blood flow. So that's what happens when we're younger. And as those estrogen levels decrease, the vagina can get you know, thin tissue, less elastic. It, on physical exam, it actually looks pale. Whereas when you're younger, it looks nice and pink. You can see oh. it pale. Yeah. So, um, so, uh, and then libido, li let me stick with vaginal dryness for just one minute and then we'll go to libido. So with vaginal dryness, there's lots of things that you can do actually. Um, one, if you're comfortable, local estrogen in your vagina is the gold standard for vaginal dryness. It works great. Um, it's safe, even for many women with breast cancer, I wouldn't say all, but some oncologists will certainly consider a vaginal estrogen at a very low dose for their patients who are low risk for recurrence. But it is, it is the one thing that you use estrogen in your vagina, your vagina is really happy. Um, so that's one thing. A lot of women don't wanna use it. They're nervous about it. it for whatever reason, or they can't because of health risks. So then you look at, um, there's hyaluronic acid um, is great. There's DHEA you can put in your vagina, which again, that turns to estrogen. So if you have breast cancer, I wouldn't recommend that. Um, you can go to the doctor and you can have a laser treatment now. Um, there's internal, there's um, different types, but we'll just say laser as a, as a general um, category. Um, they can, Essentially, they cauter, they um, do thermal damage to the vaginal lining, and then it regenerates. So it pulls in more blood flow. It pulls in that tissue regenerates, and so a lot of women do very well with that, especially if they've had breast cancer. Um, it's somewhat expensive. Uh, you do have to do it again um, to keep the results going. It's an in-office procedure. People don't feel comfortable necessarily having that done, but that's an option. Um, then there are, you know, you can always use a lubricant, but no one wants to really use a lubricant just to get through their daily life. Um, and then Joy Lux has the red light therapy, which I think works wonders. And so that's like a, a less, um, less invasive home use device where you can have red light therapy that um, goes into the vagina and um, does the same things that the lasers can do in the sense of generating uh, more blood vessels, um, improve collagen. So there's more elasticity, there's more lubrication. So vaginal dryness of all the menopausal symptoms is kind of one of the more manageable ones. Libido is way more complicated because libido has to do with your relationship, your self-esteem, how great you feel. Um, you know, so you're having things. sex with somebody without what? any interruption. Hmm. Ever. Right, right. Exactly. Like <laughs> finding that time to be just with your partner and actually tuned into your partner and, and then the partner you've been with for 30 years, you know, that sometimes is difficult too. you know, so there's lots of things with libido, but hormonally, absolutely hormones affect your libido. So a very um, low, in my mind, if you're generally a healthy person, and none of this can be construed as medical advice, as you guys know, but I would talk to your provider about just trying a little DHEA because it is overall safe, like five milligrams, and just seeing if you can have a little support there. 
that's an option. But really it also comes down to like all things in life, like communication, time, you know, bonding with your partner. Um, the, we, we did this study on our Joylux device, the um, VFIT. And what was interesting to me, there was 50 women that we looked at and it helped their urinary incontinence and it helped their um, vaginal dryness, but it also helped their libido. And I interviewed every woman after the study and I you know, just talked to them about their experience. And they said, because they were using it, it made them think about sex more and then they kind of wanted to have sex more. So another component of that is, you know, don't, you gotta use it so you don't lose it kind of a thing. So it's easy to put sex on the back burner because you don't really feel like it. I'd rather just watch TV or, you know, your partner's bothering you. But I think making that effort really does make a difference. And then your, your vagina stays a little bit more elastic because it is being used. You know, you have a good lubricant and it helps to increase your libido just to have sex. Does vaginal dryness cause severe itching? It's a question that just came. Yes, it can. So especially externally and the vulva and the labia. So if you're really dry, you're gonna be itchy. Um, women can have more urinary tract infections from vaginal dryness. They're more likely to get infections, um, either bacterial vaginosis or just the, the microbiome in the vagina gets altered when we don't have estrogen. Um, you know, our lactobacilli is our awesome, awesome bacteria. And we have tons of it in our vagina when we're healthy. But that starts to go down with menopause because the lactobacilli feed off something called glycogen, which estrogen helps the cells produce. So you have to figure out um, a way to get more lactobacilli in your body. And I think, again, nutrition is the best way to do that instead of taking a probiotic. You know, fermented foods, you know, plain yogurt, things like that are really important. But yeah, itching generalized irritation it can be red in the area you can also have a little bit around um you know the perineum can be sore sex can be uncomfortable yeah there's a lot with vaginal um a lot of symptoms with vaginal dryness i've got a question about l theanin dosing you, you spoke about it earlier how does yeah, is this so that come from your doctor yeah, I would say best to talk to your doctor. I know that the tablets come in 100 milligrams. Um, and so it's best to talk to your doctor, but 100 milligrams is a safe dose. And um, you can go up from there, but probably best to talk to your doctor. It's an over-the-counter supplement. Um, there's essentially, you know, sun theanine is the one um, producer of theanine for different companies. But it's just, you know, a lot of people sort of, instead of having a cocktail, can have theanine, you know, kind of a thing. Um, how can somebody who's looking for a doctor like you, who has the functional medicine training and the hormone experience and is also an, uh, you know, gynecologist, how would you go about searching for somebody who has a similar background? I, Dr. Sarah is based in Seattle. So if anyone on this um, call is based in Seattle, you can find Dr. Sarah Della Torre, but if you're living in New York or anywhere else in the country, what's the best way to go for um, to try to find a provider who has a really modern way of thinking? Yeah, I think that um, there's lots of functional medicine, more and more functional medicine doctors out there. Institute of Functional Medicine is where I did my training. You go to their website and um, look up women's health providers. There are some really great providers on both coasts. Um, who do, who are now doing telemedicine, right? Because we can, and because of COVID, it's kind of the only way. So, but I would search out functional medicine first and then women's health second. I don't think someone necessarily has to be a gynecologist to be a good women's health functional medicine provider. It's kind of ideal if you are, because you can do a pap smear, you can do sort of, you know, one-stop shopping. Um, but most of these doctors are going to be family medicine, OBGYN. I have, there's a great one who's an endocrinologist. She's, um, so there's, there's a variety of specialties, but I would start with functional medicine or even integrative health or a naturopath, but, um, being an MD, I have a lot of respect for NDs, but it just like with MDs, it depends on the naturopath you're finding, you know, like not all MDs are the same. Not all NDs are the same. You want to find a really high quality physician. So I would start with Institute of Functional Medicine would be a good place. I think we need to, we, we, we brushed over, but haven't gone deeper into the weight gain. Yeah. 
discussion. And that's something that's really hard because it, it does play into so many other things. If you're not, if you're gaining weight and you don't feel good about yourself um, and you can't shake the extra pounds, it's probably then gonna not make you feel sexy, which is then gonna affect your libido and you know all of the things and your mood and your anxiety. Yeah. So uh, you've mentioned plant-based diet as being something that's really good and just in terms of like the supplements and the way that you take care of yourself. Are there, what tips do you have for people who are fighting off menopause awakening? Yeah, it's hard. At what point does that start? You know, it, I, think you know I think that in the 40s, probably, probably in the late 40s, like if, if someone's always been, you know, trim, I, it is almost inevitable that a woman will say, I've always been whatever. And now it's just, and they always, they always grab, like, oh, it's just this thing or back fat, you know, just above like a little bit of a muffin top that develops. It's so frustrating. Um, so one, I would practice a little bit of body acceptance because I mean, we're all trying to be a certain way, but if you're doing everything that you can, like if you truly are, gosh, I eat really healthy. I have really great nutrition. I work out. Um, I, you know, I do setups, you know, I'm healthy. I don't drink that much alcohol and I don't have that much sugar, then that's just what it is. And I, not to be blunt, but just accept it. If you have a few pounds, it, you know, then I would probably work on more acceptance and feeling good about yourself where you are. But I own those pants. I know. And I want to wear those pants again. And I can't blame it on COVID anymore. Yeah. Well, do you feel like, I mean, just Gina, I mean, you're right in front of us. Do you feel like you kind of do everything right? And it's still- Oh, I, I was saying, we were talking about it yesterday and the formula by which I usually am able to be like, ooh, these are the pants that, you know, when things go bad, I put them on, I'm like, mm, okay. And it has been, so I stopped having my period in August and I started estrogen after my doctor told me to drink more soy milk and I had to finally- pretend that I did for six months and then finally have her put me on estrogen. Um, I mean, I'm obsessed with my Peloton. I work out five days a week. I, I have terrible arthritis, so I don't engage in grains and gluten. I don't really eat sugar. I'm now down to, God damn it, I'm down to only drinking two days a week. And it's just like every strategy that I've had before is not working for me. And I, look, I, I, my husband loves me. He still wants to have sex with me. I look fine, all of those kinds of things. It is just, I think the acceptance of every strategy that I had before that used to work for me is no longer working. And I do feel like it's a weight that I, it's in places that I've never had it before. Yeah, there's definitely a body weight distribution um, that happens in menopause. We, you know, we kind of, lose our waist a little bit. Um, we never had one anyway, because I'm Neapolitan. So I feel like <laughs> the Italians maybe get this worse. <laughs> maybe they do. We should look at different cultures and see. Totally. Or maybe like the belly was like something to be revered in Southern Italy. Sorry to interrupt you. It's like that was a place that you had the weight gain before. It's yeah. just get worse. It wasn't like, you know. Yeah. Well, I think that's I'll true. Shows up. Totally. You, you know, I'm, I'm the opposite, Gina. Like I don't gain weight in my belly, but comes on quite easily in my bottom half. And same thing where it's, I just think, okay, I'm the same, like Peloton, I eat really well. I'm like, why do I have cellulite? Like, what am I doing wrong here? And um, so weight gain is difficult. In terms of tips, I mean, Gina kind of just listed them all, um, but I think also keeping your body uh, a little bit guessing so changing your workouts, getting your metabolic rate up, you know, that testosterone might help a little bit in terms of metabolic rate. Um, the other thing that I was, I just had something in my mind about it. Um, oh, intermittent fasting. So, I you know, there's, too. yeah, so there's, you know, there's lots of things about that out there and there's different ways to do it. I think, um, I just read a really great article by a woman on fatigue. She's a physician. And um, essentially, if you think about intermittent fasting, the, the baseline that everybody in the world should do um, within reason is 12 hours, right? So from the time that you eat at night, you don't eat for 12 hours. Because when, when we eat something, 
our body actually has to do some quite complex processes to get that food digested. So if you're eating at 10 o'clock at night, that's going to disrupt your sleep. Um, you're not going to get sort of a clean, um, you know, allow your body to kind of clean itself in a way, which is a very non-medical way to say that. But um, so 12 hours. So if you if you want to eat at 7 a.m., you got to stop eating at 7 p.m. Um, a lot of people in our our age group will do pretty significant intermittent fasting. They'll only eat from noon to six, or they'll only eat from 11 to six, or something. I'm not. Sh I think for men that works pretty well. Um, and I'm not sure I'm convinced women uh, should be eating so restricted. Our hormones are a little bit more um, intricate than men's. So I'm I'm not a big fan of, you know, only eating for six hours in a day, although there, you know, there's reasonable data behind it. But I think being really keyed into just not eating after 7 p.m., you know, the old adage of no carbs after four and, you know, <laughs> not eating after 7 p.m. can actually work. Um, but you're doing that. You're not doing gluten. You're not doing. But I think one of the things that you're saying is also like it's being intuitive. It's you know what works. There are certain things that we know that we shouldn't be doing, and no matter how strict we are, the ch whether or not it's cheating or it's the ability to to love yourself enough after you've had cookies with your kids at night because life is short. And I think that's probably where the acceptance comes in as well because the self-loathing I can't imagine is great for your metabolism either. No, and I also think the midlife part of that, um, I've experienced the like eating cookies with my kids. Um, that, that attitude I actually think is so good for mental health as long as you're not like, hey, I eat cookies all the time with my kids. But you know, if you sort of are one of, you know, I think a lot of women are somewhat restrictive uh, of our habits and what we can and can't do. Um, so last night I went out and had drinks with friends and I, I came home and everybody was asleep and I, I got out this thing of ice cream and I had, I had those like thoughts where I was like, oh, oh my gosh, this is so terrible. And then I was like, no, this tastes really good. And I just decided I was just going to enjoy it. I didn't have a ton, but it tasted so good. I enjoyed every minute and then I didn't think about it again. That's an entirely new habit for me and it, it feels way better. And I think that goes a long way too. What about, this is, this is what I'm a little confused about. So there seems to be like, there's different phases. Do we, what happens, let's say 10 years after you go through menopause, do you, are these effects things that last forever? What do you expect like longer term out? Yeah, really good do question. Do you lose the weight or does the weight stay on forever? Will the hair come back? Do yeah. You, how, how, what's the next phase? Yeah, so postmenopause is an interesting phase of life. So it's kind of, I think, decade-wise. So your early 50s, you're, most women, the average age of menopause is 52. So by 55, most women have gone through menopause. Most women at age 55 are still pretty healthy. But, but what happens after menopause is more actually health risks because when we lose estrogen and we're menopausal, our cardiovascular risk starts to equal a man's. So more importantly to me than how we look is that we don't have a heart attack or a stroke, right? And so our, our lipid profile can start to be more abnormal more easily when we don't have estrogen and the protective cardioprotective effect of estrogen. Um, so if just starting from you know bottom up, um, your vagina will stay dry and get worse and sex will become more difficult if you don't manage vaginal dryness. I've had sadly some patients where their vagina really pretty much became so restricted that they couldn't have intercourse you know her husband had died 10 years ago she never did anything about it she didn't need to and then she met a new partner you know when she was 70 and and sex was not on the table you know she had to use dilators it's just a big deal so i think maintaining your vaginal health is super important as you age regardless of your partner status or whether you're having sex with your partner or not because one day you may want to um, it also reduces your risk of urinary tract infections and other complications and just irritation and itching. Um, ovarian cancer risks, you know, they're, they exist regardless of our menopausal status. Not a lot to do about that. Genetically related, kind of a random difficult cancer. Uterine cancer definitely related to our body weight. The heavier we are, the more likely we will get uterine cancer because it's an estrogen dependent um, cancer and we make estrogen in our fat, essentially. So 
Um, maintaining a body weight is important for reducing your cancer risk. Um, your breasts will will be your breasts, right? Without estrogen, I don't think estrogen after you know puberty and after childbearing, after childbearing, your breasts are your breasts unless you want to cosmetically alter them. Not a lot of change there. Just being aware of your breast cancer risk and getting your mammogram. Hair loss. Um, there's again supplements. There are lots of things on the market, I think, for hair growth now, which is a great thing. So looking at whether a little Rogaine would help, you know, taking certain supplements. But yeah, all these things will, I, I wouldn't say that they, you, you go through menopause and then you just go off a cliff with all these things. But you know, an 80 year old's hair is different than a 70 year old's hair. Um, your brain, I, to me, one of the most important components is is vital and estrogen does have benefits to the brain absolutely so you know women who have older women have, who have structure who learn an instrument you know who do their brain games who have um who have a schedule in life like they're doing things stay younger mentally and and healthy so you can tell i'm a lifestyle medicine doctor right because all these things come down to you can be healthier and you can feel better if you take care of yourself. And it does really matter. Why don't people and why don't doctors then just keep you on estrogen or estradiol if it's benign and it's so beneficial? Why stop? Um, that's a good question. I would say, again, the party line is two to five years in terms of reducing your risk of um, breast cancer. And for me personally and for my patients i will i'm on estrogen now i still have my period but i give myself i put an i wear an estrogen patch and i give myself progesterone two weeks of the month because my symptoms were so severe that i was like i can't live like this i'm still having periods but i can't live like this i'm so happy on my regimen like i just i feel so good and i don't want to change it so this is me not talking as a doctor this is me talking as a fellow woman i will probably be on estrogen my my life like i'm probably not going to take myself off estrogen i will probably always give myself a little bit of estrogen because my mom has osteoporosis we didn't even talk about bones yeah. my mom has osteoporosis i i like my healthy skin i like my healthy vagina like I, I i like my brain so i will probably until proven otherwise where it's a higher risk for me to be on estrogen i will probably keep myself on estrogen um, I've had patients, so Dr. Hat back on, I've had patients where we negotiate every year when they come in, I say, okay, well, here are the risks of you being on these hormones. Um, here are the numbers. Here's the recent data. What, what, what should we do together? Cause it's, yeah, I could choose not to prescribe to her, but I want her to be fully informed and her to make that decision of, okay, gosh, well now I'm 60. We don't know the great data about heart risk and we don't know. So maybe I'll go off it versus gosh, I feel so good. I'm not at a high heart risk. I take care of myself. I'm going to stay on it. So again, it's it's making that decision with your provider and being really well informed. I'm going to put. Can I just put on my like paranoid feminist hat right now for one second? Mm -hmm. I, I feel like so much of the information that we get is it's not how we feel. It's not. It's what we're talking about today is so empowering because so much of the messaging that we get is careful, careful, careful. This is what happens. You can't help it. You're going to look crap. You know, you're going to feel the skin, the hair, the this. And I just, I can't help but think that if men had these symptoms and these things happened to men, there would be a completely different dialogue around all of this. And the fact that this is a revelation, I know that there are some folks on this call today that I, friend of mine that I spoke to last week, and she was so angry that no one had ever told her any of these things before. Right. And so, I feel like we're all co-conspirators in this now and we have to continue to fight the misinformation. Um, but, but I can't help but think that if, that this is just yet another way the patriarchy wants to keep us down. <laughs> well, Gina, you and I are cut from the same cloth. So yeah, that's why we have Viagra, but we don't have a drug, a good drug for women. I mean, it's just drives me crazy. And, and it is a lot of fear, 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 fear. Um, which bothers me and I, I prefer women to feel empowered. Yeah, menopause, I mean, the, the upside to menopause in my mind and, and Gina, we should talk in a year from now when you're in it for a year and a well, half. Well, I'm coming to see you in June, so don't, we'll have, we can talk about it. <laughs> so, um, 
But the upside, and it sounds super cliche and cheesy, but I really believe this. I'm 49, I'm, I'll be 15 in a couple months. I really believe this. Like the, the wisdom you garner in your midlife is, um, is amazing and empowering and not that I by any means know everything. I have plenty to grow, but there's this shift that happens that um, I think, you know, there's so much about in female writers, women writers that talk about this. And I had a woman tell me the other day, she said, I really think that we lose our estrogen. You know, we spend our lives caring for other people, right? Women are trained to like care, take care, take care, ignore yourself, don't take care of yourself. And then our estrogen levels drop and we become more like men where we're like, F you, I'm not taking care of you. I got my own stuff to do. So I kind of think that's going to be a really powerful part of menopause of that balancing of the hormones of not being so giving maybe, but... I just think it's great that there are so many conversations like this, that women are taking control of that conversation, that a lot of female founded products that are coming out, um, companies devoted to where we are in our life cycles. There's so much in the fertility space right now. There's so much going on with um, in, in parenting, but that the next phase of life is also being dealt with too. And that this is becoming a much more open, honest, and um, proactive conversation. So we are going to post this entire conversation on our blog, it should be up tomorrow. So if anybody on here missed part of it, or if you wanna spread the word and amplify this message out to your friends, I found this to be an incredibly empowering conversation. Thank you so, so, so much for all of this information. I mean, we just kept you talking for an hour. Gina, thank you for sharing your journey and your questions um, <laughs> and i always learn so much from you and i love you <laughs> and uh and and thank you to everyone on the second trip to join this this is actually like was one of the most well attended and most interactive uh, that we've had so far so we clearly hit a hot button so happy international hot, women's hot, month happy everyone the hot button stuff yeah <laughs> Happy Women's Month, everybody. Thank you so much for being here. Thanks for having me. That was fun. Take, Take care, Dr. Sarah. Bye.